Hey, everybody. Today we're talking about significance testing for proportions. Um, by now, hopefully you've noticed that whenever you have a technique for constructing a confidence interval, there's a corresponding um, significance test. With proportions, it's no different. Um, we're going to look at an example that is completely typical of how these go, um, and so it's, it'll be generalized, but it's not a specific case. According to the internet, 39% of humans have type O positive blood. I read that on the internet. A skeptical researcher collects a sample of size n equals 28, finding seven O positives. Um, so we want to evaluate the claim of the internet that 39% of humans have type O positive blood. Um, we want to get a p-value, see if it's low enough, if, it rep if our sample represents good evidence against the internet's claim. Let's do this. Let's start by writing down null and alternative hypotheses appropriate to this question. So as always, the null hypothesis should be that our sample is just due to random chance, that in fact the um, claim of the internet, sort of the default claim, is true. In this case, that P is 0.39, that 30%, 39% of humans have type O positive blood. The alternative hypothesis is the thing we're actually interested in, the thing that we are uh, thinking is, might be true. In this case, that the population um, proportion is not 39%. Notice that both hypotheses here are written in terms of parameters. These are making statements about the entire population, not about the sample. Our sample mean, or rather our sample proportion, p hat, is going to be the thing that allows us to distinguish which one of these is more plausible. Great. So um, we assume the null hypothesis. We assume that the population proportion is actually 39%. And we want to calculate the probability of getting a p hat, like the one we got, or more extreme, just by random chance. So in order to evaluate that probability, we're going to have to say something about the sampling distribution of p hat. That requires us to step back um, and think about what that, might like, what that might look like. So the big idea here is that we're going to view p hat, the sample proportion. Let me write it a bit more neatly. As a mean of Bernoulli trials. So a Bernoulli trial is a um, random variable where you can either have a zero or one, a failure or success. Um, the success has probability p. And the idea is here is that we should have an independent one of those, ones of those, and then the p hat is just going to be the average if we add all of them up. So um, a Bernoulli trial let's call each one xi, has a very simple discrete probability distribution. Let's go ahead and write it down. So the two possible outcomes are 1 and 0, success and failure. And the probability of success, um, we denote p. In this case, we've assumed the null hypothesis. We've assumed a probability of success on any individual draw of 39%. So That'll be 0.39. For the moment, we'll just write p to get a little bit more generality. And then the probability of failure, of course, is 1 minus p, because these are complementary outcomes. Great. In past lectures, we saw the mean of such a thing. The expected value is just p. And the variance, we also computed. We got p times 1 minus p. Again, these are for individual Bernoulli trials. OK. Now we know if we take a mean of these, we're adding up a bunch of independent random variables, identically distributed. Um, we have formulas for getting the mean and standard deviation then of that mean. Moreover, the central limit theorem tells us something about the shape of the distribution. Let's write it. By the central limit theorem, if, P, if n is somewhat large, 
then we know the sampling distribution of p hat is going to be approximately normal. And it's going to have the same mean as the underlying distribution, in other words, of a single Bernoulli child. So p comma. Its variance, however, will be the variance of the individual trials scaled down by a factor of n. So it's p times 1 minus p over n. Great. So if we were to go out um, and get samples of the same size over and over and over again, assuming the null hypothesis is true, sometimes the p hats would be a little high, sometimes a little low. Overall, though, they'd have a normal distribution with these, um, with these parameters. What we need to do now is to find the probability of getting a p hat at least as extreme as the one we actually got. So we need the probability of getting by random chance um, a p hat, try and write this legibly, farther from, in this case, 0.39. And 0.25. And 0.25 came from the fact that we had seven successes in 28 trials. One quarter. Okay. To evaluate this probability statement, let's do z scores. So in this case, we have z is the proportion we got, 0.25, minus the proportion that we expected, 0.39, divided by the standard deviation of p hat, which we know is the square root of this thing. Square root of 0.39 times 0.61 over the sample size of 28. And when we compute that, we get negative 1.52. And we know from long experience with the normal distribution, that's not a huge um, z-score. Great. So the probability statement we wrote a moment ago can be rewritten as the probability of getting a z-score greater than this an absolute value, further away from zero than this probability that the absolute value of z is greater than or equal to 1.52. As always, I encourage you to use technology for this, not a table. In R, the command is going to be a p-norm. Um, it'll be twice the p-norm of negative 1.52, which comes out to be 0.123. Now, this is the p-value. Before I say anything more about that, let's just take a moment longer to discuss how I got this calculated, how I got this answer. Um, and as usual, when I'm talking about a normal distribution, I'm going to draw pictures. Um, I think I'm going to erase a little higher on the board here. OK. So probability that z in absolute value is greater than or equal to 1.52. So here's a bell curve. And here's the z-score I have, negative 1.52. So assuming the null hypothesis is true, my sample mean was 1.52 standard deviations below the mean in the distribution of all possible sample means. What's the probability of getting something by random chance at least that extreme? Well, here's the area that's more extreme in that direction. But I'm also interested in at least 1.52 standard deviations in the opposite direction as well. It's over here. So the shaded area that I have here um, is representing this probability. How am I going to actually calculate it? I'm going to find the area to the left here and double it. Double it. 
P norm of negative 1.52 is this area over here. Great. So this is our P value. Point one two three is not a huge p value. Um, without even looking at our alpha, we know that this is not going to provide strong evidence against our null hypothesis. Um, we know that smaller p values are stronger evidence, larger p values are weaker evidence. Essentially, this is saying that even if the null hypothesis is true, we could get a result at least this extreme more than 12% of the time. Um, that's not that rare. So it's not ludicrous to think that this might have just happened by chance. Now, in this case, we do have a specific alpha. Let's use it. Let's draw a specific conclusion. Since p is 0.123, which is greater than alpha, which is 0.05, we do not reject. H naught. There's insufficient evidence to reject H naught and to accept the alternative hypothesis um, that in fact a different percentage than 39% of humans have type O positive blood. Now we should be a little careful here. Um, just because we're failing to reject H naught does not mean that we have evidence in favor of H naught. In fact, our sample data. 25% came out pretty far away from the null hypothesis data, um, the null hypothesis suggestion of 39%. I certainly don't want to view that as, as arguing in favor of the 39% parameter. Um, what we are saying here is that we just don't have statistically strong evidence um, to rule out that null hypothesis. 